is connected to nearly everything we do. And everything we eat was grown by someone somewhere. Yet from farm to fork, we're disconnected from our food like never before. And while it's the biggest thing we do, there's plenty of room for improvement. Fortunately, improvement is something we're especially good at. We produce more food than ever. That could be better at getting it onto people's plates. We have choices, but not all of them are equal. It's a big, complex problem with lots of moving parts. And the decisions we make now will determine whether or not we're ready to feed 9 billion people by 2050. Join us as we investigate the future of food. Because no matter who you are, what you do, or where you live, we all have to eat. of the Feed the Future Global Forum. Uh, before we get started with our program of the day, I wanted to note some housekeeping things and, and also just to help you with how the agenda will flow today because we actually have an exciting day packed with great speakers and still great time for you to continue the discussions amongst yourself that have proven to be so fruitful over time. Um, at today's lunch, we will plan inter interest group discussions. Salon 4. Um, we asked you yesterday and the day before to provide thoughts on small group discussions that we could have to cover items that we haven't gotten to as much during the agenda um, because we wanted to give people time to do those amongst themselves. Um, we will remind you of this later, but so far we have five breakout sessions scheduled for the lunch. Um, the topics are um, how can we work most effectively with and through regional organizations, that's number one. The second is on resilience programming. How best do we link Feed the Future activities with humanitarian and disaster preparedness? The third will be on scaling. Uh, we'd like people to have a discussion on their experiences in developing and implementing scaling plans. The fourth will be about partnership, specifically how to increase partnership among US government agencies at the local level in the field. It's something we wrangle with in Washington quite a bit, so it would be great to, I'm glad to hear that there's a desire to have more of that conversation at the field level. And finally, the last one will be about technology and education. How can we best educate our stakeholders about technology, specifically uh, biotech? So that, that's a topic that has come up a few times today, so we want to make sure you have time for that. Um, next, for senior government officials here from Feed the Future countries around the world, I would really like and find your feedback and input on our experiences with feed, on your experience with Feed the Future valuable. So please join me and other leaders of Feed the Future in an informal discussion at the lunch break in Arlington Salon 5. Um, and we will direct people outside as this is coming up. The last two days have been really extraordinary. And the first day we had a great retrospective of kind of where we've been, what started Feed the Future, and the challenges that lay ahead. And yesterday we moved to this table, uh, this round table format that we are continuing today um, to really allow us to have more time to interact with each other um, and to talk about what's working, what we see is working, and, and how we can do that in other places. Um, and today we'll really focus on what's next. How do we take this forward? How do we scale the activities that we see that are working? How do we bring in more youth and next generation leaders? What is the path that we're charting forward for Feed the Future? Um, one of the things, because I mentioned this roundtable format, I wanted to give you a minute to stop now and to introduce yourselves to each other at your table. So I will break for a minute and please just quick introductions at your tables. <laughs> I'd like, before we move into our first guest speaker, because so much of this is about learning and what we will take from this going forward, I'd like to take a moment to allow some of our colleagues to provide their perspectives on yesterday's conversation. conversation. Um, I'd, for the first person I'd like to hear from is Fina Kaisanabo from our Rwanda mission. 
Fina, can you please tell us what your key takeaways from our time together so far at the forum have been, particularly from yesterday? Fina's over there. So uh, I work for the USAID uh, mission in Rwanda. So my perspective will come from um, a programmatic uh, view, uh, mostly. And I will talk about the breakout sessions. Uh, there was an uh, interesting discussion and time for questions and, uh, and, uh, and discussions. Um, I participated in two uh, breakout sessions. One was about uh, engaging uh, the private sector. And uh, something that is, so I will always relate to the, um, to the Rwanda situation uh, that could be applied. Uh, we all know that there's a need of trust, but the implication of trust will require a lot of evaluation and assessment. I think this is something that we need to do uh, in Rwanda and probably in many missions to develop that culture um, in design until the implementation and, and being open to, um, to admit weaknesses and, and strength and where um, they could um, address the gaps um, together with all government and private sector. Um, as well as uh, accountable, so admitting to be accountable. So generally one part will be more accountable to the other. The public will be more accountable to the situation in Rwanda and elsewhere in the region um, that will be the reverse. So the accountability uh, and the dialogue process is very important. On the nutrition, uh, on the nutrition side, this is interesting. So Rwanda has done, is known for many things, for great policies and strategies, and, uh, but on the data side, it's not got getting along uh, together. Uh, and the thing that uh, I liked a lot uh, from the, one of the approaches that was uh, shared was the intensity, they call it the Alive and Stride the initiative, call it the intensity of stunting uh, approach. I think this is, uh, it's, it's, it's need to be uh, evaluated, uh, data needs to be shown uh, and demonstrated and presented and again and again to convince uh, donors and policy makers uh, that invest a lot into that and how to integrate um, agriculture and health uh, programs that are often soft type uh, and having those together on the ground because you have this big uh, budget uh, investment that and institution that often do not talk uh, together not only in USA but even outside um, so the intensity, we could leverage on the ground, we could leverage investment. There's a lot of community-based uh, initiatives uh, that are driven not only in health, in education, in, in, in agriculture, with extension services, with feed um, chief uh, leader farmers. Now all those resources could be leveraged to integrate uh, a more uh, nutritious, um, appropriate nutritious education and interactive com uh, communication with the farmers. So I think that's the main two, um, two messages that I get from the breakout session yesterday. Thank you, Fina, for sharing those observations. Next, I would like Michelle Jennings from our USAID Africa Bureau, um, who was previously in our Central America and Mexico office, um, to share your high points and impressions from yesterday. Well, thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. It was very exciting and full of a lot of thoughtful ideas yesterday, and it's a great opportunity to be here to learn, listen, get to know everybody. And there was a, about two, two or three themes that I'd like to highlight from yesterday, and I was certainly motivated by Reverend Beckman's kind of call to service and this exodus from hunger, and I think it's probably something that everybody in here can empathize and, and get on board with, but I think the, the message of leadership and advocacy really resonated with me and how important it is to um, instill and take this leadership role in your country at all different levels, at a country level, within the USG, maybe within your own office, et cetera, and advocacy. And, and what really was powerful was this partnerships and the power of partnerships that Oxfam talked about and how they moved Coca-Cola or the multilaterals into really having this kind of transformational impact 
And that is working within an existing market system, so I think we need to tap into that a little bit more. Um, and then also, as we talked about the technical areas, nutrition, value chains, um, partnerships, there is a real um, call for the systems approach and the systemic, systemic change versus the puffs of success, which I liked. Um, and I think um, working to adapt within the local context and not necessarily swimming upstream, but sort of going with the current and finding those opportunities and, and looking for interventions within those points of opportunity um, was interesting and important for us to note. And then lastly, um, the farmer-driven and farmer-centered approach, which it, and derive solutions from the farmer and the community. And I think we talk a lot about that and I don't think anybody would deny that that's important. And somehow we have to rationalize that with, within our imperatives and political um, pressures to actually show results. So we need to maybe get more social anthropologists working with us on that analysis so that we truly understand the local context, the community and farmer driven and centered <coughs> solution and then somehow rationalize that within our you know, imperatives to show impact, and that's a real huge challenge. And lastly, just this um, focus on in the, um, research and innovation, and it wasn't necessarily talked about in one specific session, but it's very important, and then finding ways to link that back into how we're operating, maybe not as new ideas, but as adaptions to existing um, uh, systems and models. And um, yeah, uh, some really interesting investments in research and innovation, and if I see Sahara Moon wearing those Afla goggles at the bar in the penis, I'm gonna follow <laughs> her lead. <laughs> Thank you very much, look forward to today. Thank you, Michelle and Fina. We, we greatly appreciate that. And, and we hope that um, later today in your breakout sessions that you will all be able to continue to share your observations from yesterday and, and how we move forward. Today is our chance to look forward to the challenges ahead, to the specific actions we can take to address them, and to the strong leadership, courage, and continued inspiration it will take to achieve Feed the Future's goals for a better future, one of shared progress and prosperity through economic growth driven by agricultural development. It is now my distinct and great ple pleasure and privilege to welcome Dr. Helene Gale as our keynote speaker for the morning. Dr. Gale is CEO of CARE USA, one of our extremely valuable implementing and thought partners. This is a post she has held since 2006 after stints with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and numerous agencies of the federal government uh, as a leading public health expert in, in HIV, TB, and reproductive health. Dr. Gale's leadership of care has made her a deeply supportive friend of Feed the Future and a friend of so many of us today. CARE was on the front lines of our thinking in terms of how to reform our food aid system to get more food to more people and a, more, and a healthier food basket to people. CARE has also been a leading thought partner in gender issues and how to make sure that women have equitable access to the tools and the training that we are providing under Feed the Future. We are all inspired by Dr. Gale and her leadership of CARE. Um, and, and we look forward to great partnership in the future, just as we've had today. Dr. Gale, please, welcome to the Feed the Future Global Forum. Thanks, and good morning. Um, thanks so much for that very kind introduction, and it is wonderful to be here, and uh, it, it's really remarkable when you look out on it all, audience and know that this is the third day of the conference and the room is, is still full. So that really says that we are here, we're serious, and people um, really are um, engaged in what it means to build the kind of partnerships that it's going to take to make a difference. Um, I also just want to thank and, and recognize the real leadership of Jada and, and the rest of her team and the incredible job that Feed the Future has been doing. Um, and also for this first um, in, inaugural global forum, 
it really is a testament to the incredible partnerships that it is going to take to make a difference. Uh, this is really, really an important initiative, and I think this has come up over and over again, how Feed the Future and the collective work that all of us in this room are engaged in um, is really helping to contribute to moving this whole area forward, but particularly looking at this issue of how food and nutrition security uh, contribute to our development agenda and then something that I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about, um, how it's contributing to resilience and how we need to think about incorporating this whole notion of resilience and building resilient communities into it. In the few minutes that I have, I'm going to say a few words about our experience in this realm, CARES, and then try to think about what are some of the unanswered questions or things, areas that we need to continue to push ourselves on. Uh, first of all, why is this particular effort so important? Uh, I'm not going to say a lot about it. I know a lot has been said about the accomplishments of Feed the Future, but I think it's also important for us in this room to not gloss over how much has been accomplished. Um, illustrative of that is the fact that, you know, in the last year, 12 million children who were suffering from um, hidden hunger have been helped. Big number. Seven million smallholder farmers have started using new tools and technologies. And I know, you know, there are a lot of data that have gone on, but I think it's important for us to step back and remember how much has been done. I'm very encouraged that the U.S. government has ramped up its commitment over the last few years to global food uh, security and agriculture through things like Feed the Future, the Global Alliance for Nutrition, uh, Food Security and Nutrition, and other things. And so I, I want us first and foremost to step back and celebrate where we have come and remember what an incredible movement we're creating. I also, you know, want to say, for me, one of the big things is looking around this room and seeing this audience. This is a very different audience than we might have had 20 years ago when we were talking about this issue. We're clearly more uh, broader, more inclusive, and I think it shows that we're really creating a movement, that there's real momentum in a different way when we look around the room and seeing how inclusive it is. So I think that there's a lot that we're doing right and we are moving in the right direction in so many ways. But, as we all know, there's still a lot of challenges. You know, uh, again, numbers that I know are very familiar to people, 15, uh, uh, over a, a billion people who are still hungry and, and undernourished. Um, a lot of household and community inequality. And we know that, you know, we're in a world where there is growing inequality bet between nations and among nations. Um, the need that are going to be bigger in the future to nourish 9.6 billion by the year 20, uh, 2050, and the big issue of climate change and the, and the increasing shocks, whether it's flood or drought, that we have to also figure into this picture. So it's a tall order, and to do that and to address that, we need know that we need to do everything to make sure that we're equal to that task. And I think that it means more and more that we need to be thinking about what does it mean to really have a holistic and an integrated approach to tackling poverty and hunger that really leads to building systems and looking at systematic change and not just doing what we've always done, which is to do great programs, or great, great projects. How do we bring all that together in a way that really is helping us build systems that lead to a different kind of future? I think that means starting with making sure that we're looking at the underlying causes, not just the consequences, so looking at political issues, um, social, economic, environmental, issues like gender inequality, and, and really making sure that we're tackling some of those underlying causes in the way that we, we deal with it. Re recognizing that if we're looking at these issues of risk and shock, that we need to do more to link our humanitarian responses with our development efforts. Um, so that we're looking both at what do we do with the short-term issues, but also linking those to our longer developmental um, impacts, and then creating an enabling environment in which poor populations thrive and making sure that we're really addressing the issues of household vulnerability, not just that they don't have enough food, but continuing to push ourselves to ask the question why, and building policies. And I'm glad um, Jada talked about some of the issues around food aid reform, a big issue for us, but really looking at are we making sure that we have the enabling environment and policies that go along with that. 
So let me just um, talk about a, a few little examples from our own experience as an organization that kind of draws on some of these issues of, uh, that, that I think help to look at creating broad systemic change and broader approaches that are more integrated. So first, an example of, um, of how do we look broader even regionally. So taking a regional approach to some of the work that we do. And I'll give the example of CARE's Sahel resistant, uh, Resilience Strategy, which is a cross-sector approach that looked at the entire region uh, of the Sahel and aligns with the Global Alliance for Resilience in West Africa and the Sahel, a program that is partially funded by USAID. And this stepped back and looked at the, our experience in 2012. We know that the, um, this was the third major crisis in seven years in the Sahel, affecting um, in, in nearly half of children under five in Burkina Faso, Chad, and Mali, and Niger. Uh, and so it was a huge crisis. We did a lot, like a lot of organizations. We had a brisk humanitarian response, uh, hel helped almost a million people. But when we stepped back and evaluated the response, we realized that there was a critical need to develop a coherent, overarching, resilient strategy in the Sahel, um, a strategy that goes beyond addressing crisis to crisis. So we worked with intergovernmental bodies, local civil society, our peer NGO and research institutions to really look at what does it take to build a, um, a much more resilient approach, focusing on women, girls, and children under five, those who are most vulnerable um, to climate change, conflict, and recurrent crisis, and then work to really look at how do you develop a strategy that integrates development and humanitarian dynamics, but doing that on a regional approach. Uh, second, how do you look at these more integrated programs? And one example uh, is from the GRAD program, a USAID-funded program uh, through Feed the Future in Ethiopia. Now, this is a program that helps poor families graduate from poverty and resilience um, and, and reliance on food aid. It links them to things like microfinance services, functioning markets, encouraging women's participation, strengthening their skills in teaching new farmer, farming and natural resource techniques. So it enables smallholder farmers and workers to better provide um, live, lives and livelihoods for their family, bolsters resilience to climate change and other shocks and stresses, and helps them to, to nab, um, reduce negative impacts on the ecosystem. So again, this notion of integrating food and nutrition security into programs that will lead to longer term household resilience and ultimately less reliance and need for food aid. Third, partnership uh, between CARE and the World Wildlife um, Fund, our CARE WWF Alliance working hand in hand with a partner whose core expertise is in preserving the environment, complementing our own expertise in the development arena. Uh, two projects with CARE and WWF, one where we're working with coastal households in East Africa in Mozambique to secure healthy marine ecosystems while we're helping fishing communities have a sustainable source of nutrition and income. A second in Nepal, and this is one that's uh, also funded by USAID, uh, working with uh, reducing the adverse impact of climate change and threats to biodiversity in Nepal among poor communities whose livelihoods are linked to timber growing. So again, looking at how do we preserve the ecosystem at the same time that we're looking at how to make sure that people have sustainable livelihoods. And it's based on the simple fact that food and nutrition security cannot exist without healthy ecosystems. Fourth, uh, just to, um, to mention briefly, academic partnerships. And I know that um, Kathy Wateki is going to talk a lot more about research, but I think it's important to remember that for those of us who are on the implementing side, making sure that we're having strong research partnerships that can be, help us to really look at um, what we're learning and incorporate and embed research from the very beginning. So CARE has a partnership with Cornell, bringing the strengths and opportunities of these two organizations together to help develop more innovations in, in our solutions through cutting edge research and practice which can be replicated and hopefully uh, scaled up for longer term sustainability. 
Uh, finally, our work with the private sector and private sector partnerships. I think this has been talked about a lot throughout this forum, but this is another area where we believe that long-term partnerships with companies in which shared values inform shared vision of a future for poor communities with a particular focus on uh, women and women smallholder farmers really has a lot of potential for um, shifting the way that we do business. So with agriculture, food, and beverage companies, we found a lot of success working together to help smallholder farmers engage in the global marketplace to meet global demands. These partnerships help to bridge this gap between the demand for certain crops and providing farmers with access to market. So a few examples. Uh, in Madagascar, we're working with General Mills and haagen -Dazs. Madagascar is the, the largest um, uh, supplier of, of vanilla around the world, but we're working to make sure that smallholder farmers are incorporated into the global supply chain um, uh, with, with the needs for sourcing vanilla. Cargill, our partnership in Cargill that we've had for over 20 years, uh, has just been renewed to put an increased emphasis not only on incorporating farmers into the global supply chain, but also in working with those communities. So in cocoa producing regions in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, we're helping farmers optimize their productivity at the same time that CARE is supporting these communities in improving basic educational services so that parents begin to see the value of sending their children to school instead of working in the fields. Agco, um, we're working with Agco, which is a, a company that uh, focuses on global agricultural machinery, developing a partnership to look at a profitable model to sell tractors and other needs um, to smallholder farmers who oftentimes haven't had access to equipment. We think a lot about access to seeds, but if we really want farmers to make the next leap, thinking about how do they get access to the kind of equipment that can help them have greater crop yields and become greater able to contribute to global supply chain and to feeding their family. Those are just some of the examples from some of the ways in which we're trying to look at different kinds of partnerships, which I think this forum is very much all about. So given what we're learning, where are some of the things that we need to step back and continue to challenge ourselves as we think about how we move forward to the future, and where are some of the opportunities? And I think, again, while I want us to all celebrate all the things that we're doing so well, I think it's also important, if we want to do the best by the people we serve, that we keep questioning ourselves and thinking about how we move forward. So a few things. First, again, I think this sense of how do we have a broader focus in the way that we look at our work. And that's a broader focus both regionally through looking at regional programs, but also making sure that we're, we're broader in our targeting of population, broader in our understanding of food and food systems, including things like the environment, ecosystem, marine resources and fisheries, livelihood, all along um, every chain of the, uh, every stage of the value chain, and making sure that we're assuring the right and equitable participation uh, it, with individuals, households, and, and communities. Second, the whole issue of addressing waste, and I haven't gotten into that a lot, but I know that this is a topic that, we, that you have talked about, and one that I think we really haven't yet done enough to really focus on. And that's waste both here in this country, where we waste a lot of food unnecessarily, as well as looking at the really key issue of, de of developing countries and post-harvest loss. So really doing a better job of thinking not only what are we doing on the producing side, but where are we losing some of the valuable gains um, that, that we've made. Third, and uh, Jada mentioned this uh, some in her introduction, putting the needs of smallholder farmers, but especially women, at the core of our strategy. But then knowing that that's not enough. I think we talk a lot about the importance of engaging smallholder farmers and looking at the needs uh, of smallholder farmers, but I think really looking at this issue more broadly, how are we making sure that smallholder farmers' needs for nutrition uh, within the household, but then also linking to markets, and what does that mean in terms of uh, moving up the chain and, um, and really creating a different sort of environment for smallholder farmers to thrive? 
Um, and finally, the whole issue of innovative partnerships. Uh, again, I think we talk a lot about partnerships. We all in this room know how tough it is to partner. It's always, it's oftentimes easier to stay in our own boxes. It's more comfortable. But how do we stretch beyond that, um, get greater engagement from all partners, governments, non-traditional partners like academia, tech companies, and then looking at how the U.S. government can both use its resources but really also leverage its influence to encourage other donor nations, um, other donor organizations, and also to continue to encourage greater focus on this issue and investment from host, government, um, uh, comp from host governments. So let me just uh, wrap up and say in closing, I really do believe we are headed in the right direction, um, but we still have a long way to go if we're going to really do the best by the people we serve and by our goal of making this more, a more just and equitable world. I think ultimately we're all here because we're working towards a common goal, and I think that should encourage us, but it should also humble us. Everyone here and our local partners and staff on the ground bring so, so much to the table, knowledge, expertise, and ideas that all add value to an effort that can only continue to accelerate if we adapt and do whatever is necessary, whatever it takes to make sure that we're doing the most for the most people in the most effective and sustainable way. So finally, just to close with a quote. When I gave food to the poor, they called me a saint. When I asked why the poor have no food, they called me a communist. Now, I've never been remotely accused of being a saint, and I'm really not that anxious to be called a communist. However, while we know we will continue to need to give people food from time to time, I think if we continue to ask that bigger question, then we will continue to push ourselves and we'll not only be asking that question, but we'll also be getting the answer right. So thank you very much, and I appreciate so much being a part of this. Thank you, Dr. Gale, for those inspiring words. My name is Julie Howard. I'm the chief scientist here in the Bureau for Food Security and senior advisor to Administrator Shaw for Agricultural Research, Extension, and Education. And, and thanks, Dr. Gale, for kicking us off in, in such a wonderful way. You know, I think sort of laying out the, the full breadth of, of challenges and opportunities and then uh, closing us off with that, with that inspiring quote. I think, you know, long before I came into USAID, I, I valued CARES partnership both in the policy space and in the field. Uh, that remains very important for us. So thank you for, for challenging us. And I think, you know, committing to be with us every step of the way as we go forward. Um, our next speaker, um, I'm happy to introduce. I'm going to say a few words before she comes up here. Uh, but she's going to continue sort of, I, I know, challenging us for the future um, on what our research opportunities uh, are. But I wanted to say, um, reflect back on, on 2010, 2009, uh, L'Aquila, uh, the, the initiation of Feed the Future, almost one of the first things that happened uh, after uh, the announcement of Feed the Future was setting up a, a series of consultations uh, with USAID, USDA, in partnership with the U.S. University community, our CGIAR partners, other uh, research partners around the world, to figure out, well, what is it important for us to do in Feed the Future on agricultural research? And Rob Bertram, my colleague in the back, and Gabisa Ajeda from Purdue University, uh, and Kathy herself, Kathy Wotecki, our, our next speaker, were instrumental in sort of creating that, that spirit of partnership that I think drives so many things in a very important direction in, in Feed the Future. So that series of consultations, e-consultations, physical consultations, really set the, um, the framework, the strategic priorities for Feed the Future in, uh, in agricultural research. Um, and we've been very, very busy, and I think successfully implementing uh, those priorities since. Um, we'll speak a little bit about that. But I think we're very proud to say that our investments in agricultural research uh, since Feed the Future began have more than doubled. Um, and we've launched 23 new Feed the Future innovation labs that, that tackle different challenges, problem sets, uh, led by U.S. universities and involving uh, CGIAR partners and private sector partners as well, and, and national and regional partners. 
Plus, more than 70 U.S. universities are involved in these Speed to Future innovation labs. One of the great opportunities with Speed to Future, though, is this whole of government approach that we've been talking about over the past, uh, past few days. And I think our, our challenge and opportunity with the US, this USAID-USDA partnership is to, is to harness the, the huge, huge research capacity uh, that, that, that is overseen by Dr. Wotecki um, and is visible on U.S. university campuses and, and, and USDA labs throughout the country. So our challenge really was to how do we better harness that, that real intellectual capacity and pull it together with the, the adaptive programs and the partnerships that USAID has. And I think we're, we're seeing, we've already been talking about some examples over the past couple of days, our, our work on legume productivity, very much in partnership with USDA, our partnership on wheat rust, our partnership on, on data systems. We had a plenary panel on, on that yesterday, but livestock genomics and, and vaccines. But of course, there, there are many more areas where we can partner, but we've, we've made quite a lot of progress already. So in all of this, uh, Dr. Catherine Wotecki has, has been one of the strongest partners uh, for Feed the Future, and it's just a delight uh, to welcome her to the podium today to talk with us. Um, she is the undersecretary for the U.S. Department of Agricultural Research, Education, and Economics. She's also the department's chief scientist. She oversees four agencies, the Agricultural Research Service, the National Institute for Food and Agriculture, the Economic Research Service, the National Agricultural Statistics Service. Do you ever sleep? Okay. Okay. And before that, she, of course, has had a distinguished career. Uh, she was the Global Director of Scientific Affairs for Mars Incorporated. She was the Dean of Agriculture Professor of Human Nutrition at Iowa State. I could go on and on, but I think we'd rather hear from Kathy herself. Kathy? Well, thank you very much, Julie, and good morning, everyone. It's a real delight for me to be part of your program. Uh, and as Julie indicated, we at USDA have been a partner with Feed the Future from the very beginning. Uh, we've been really pleased to be included at the early planning stages. And uh, as part of our efforts, what we did was to really decide early on we were going to tightly focus our efforts around some really important problems that we're facing farmers and their families in the Feed the Future countries. And, and Julie has mentioned these already, the Wheat Stem Rust Initiative focusing on developing uh, resistant uh, varieties, uh, particularly uh, on the, the big scourge right now, UG99, uh, for improving nutrition to focus on legumes. And our efforts are to develop locally adapted, culturally appropriate leg leguminous crops that are going to improve the protein content of, of diets. On food safety, uh, we focused around reducing aflatoxin, particularly in maize, and, and have a product that's actually out and, and being implemented that can reduce the uh, colonization with the fungus that, that produces uh, aflatoxin. And then on the animal agriculture side, really tightly focusing on, on vaccine development, and our number one candidate is uh, East Coast fever. In addition, um, we have an enormous amount of capability in statistics and in economic analysis that uh, in partnership with Feed the Future countries is providing technical assistance in evaluating the agricultural statistic systems in Feed the Future countries with an eye towards uh, improving those capacities because we're not going to be able to know how well we're doing if we not, don't have good, reliable data. So I wanted to focus my efforts today on talking with you just very briefly about research for, for the future. And when I think about agricultural research, I think about scouts. Every farmer scouts his or her field. They look for emerging pests, is the crop wilted, maybe some evidence of, of disease. And our research programs are like that, particularly in Feed the Future, really tightly focused on what are the problems in uh, Feed the Future countries that we've identified. But scouts also are a part of, very important part of exploration, uh, going out into unknown territory, 
trying to uh, figure out the, the lay of the land and uh, to scout any problems that, that might be on the horizon. And our agricultural science uh, fits both of those models. Uh, so the question that I wanted to talk with you today is what we're doing to link our domestic research agenda with the Feed the Future objectives, and also how can we be working much more long-term with the important countries that are investing in agricultural science to harness those new information and their skills and knowledge uh, to benefit people around the world. We have a long history uh, at USDA of bilateral and, and multilateral engagement in agricultural research. And certainly we continue to do those activities uh, in addition to our tight focus on Feed the Future. Let's see, can I have the next slide please? So what we've done is to uh, focus our research agenda. Uh, again, within USDA, we're primarily domestically focused, but uh, we've focused our research agenda on what we see as the emerging challenges to American agriculture. And these very closely align with the grand challenges that Feed the Future is addressing. So feed the food security is uh, one of these challenges both domestic and international, and our Feed the Future work, most of it is nested in this feed, uh, food security priority. But it's not enough just to produce enough food. Uh, it ha that food has to be safe uh, for the population because if it's not safe, it's not going to be health promoting. Uh, our third uh, uh, major research priority is improving human nutrition and health and understanding what that array of foods that are necessary for long-term uh, good health is. We're trying to do all of these uh, in a way that is going to provide long-term sustainable agricultural systems. To do all of that in the context of changing climate that is going to pr produce uh, great challenges to farmers around the world. And also to accomplish all of that when more is being demanded of agriculture to provide biofuels and other products, uh, important chemicals used for manufacturing, for pharmaceuticals, uh, and for other industrial applications. So these challenges are facing countries developed as well as developing around the world. Uh, certainly the situation may be more acute in de the developing world, and in the United States we recognize that our futures are linked. So in meeting these challenges, uh, we're really focusing our efforts on sustainable intensification of agricultural production, recognizing that there are limits on arable land and water resources, uh, developing resilient systems, resilient to climate change and its challenges of drought and heat and pests and diseases, making sure that this is an array of nutritious, health-promoting, safe food, not just focusing on calories. And lastly, on sharing the information that comes from our public investment in science. So around the world, um, there, this graph shows you the public investment in agricultural science. The blue line that's on the top represents the U.S. investment beginning in 1981 and, and uh, up to uh, recent years. And our investment domestically has plateaued and, and decreased substantially over the last few years. The line that's climbing up is China which has now surpassed us as being the major public funder of agricultural science. Um, and there are a number of countries like India and Brazil that have been consistently over time increasing at a slow pace their research investment. Now I'm focusing on the public investment because the public investment is so important for fundamental science you know, moving forward the frontiers of what we know about agricultural systems at a very fundamental level. 
that fundamental understanding is really important for the future. So that public investment is enormously important for the scout, the exploration role that I talked about. The public investment is also very important because our public research tends to support what economists call common goods. Uh, so our research investment tends to focus from the public sector on that fundamental science as well as on natural resources, human nutrition, aspects of food safety, and also this long-term climate adaptation that is so important. The public investment also tends to focus on what we here in the United States call minor crops that uh, are ones where the private sector will not be getting a large return for an investment. So therefore, the public investment on the development of these new varieties, and most of these are fruits and vegetables here in the US, is very important. Around the world, we know that the investment in science and education is enormously important for increasing agricultural productivity. Economists have, have developed what they call uh, the, uh, an, an index of total factor productivity, or TFP. Uh, and this is the part of the increase in agricultural production that's attributable to innovation and the adaptation of that innovation. I think of, of, of total factor productivity as an indicator of uh, innovation and know-how. So you know, you've got innovations and farmers know how to, to apply them. And as you look at this map of the world, the darkest color, the brown, is where total factor productivity growth has been more than 3% a year. And the yellow is where it's been less than 1% a year. So this productivity uh, is very important in Feed the Future countries. So lastly, um, the kind of things that we've been working with other countries on around how do we link our domestic research agenda to the very important concerns of improving agricultural productivity around the world are shown here. Uh, the US, along with the G8 countries, has been working on an open data initiative uh, to prioritize agricultural and nutrition data that are the result of that public investment in agricultural science. We held a, a forum here in Washington uh, uh, last year, and uh, just this past month uh, have, with the UK and FAO, held uh, a meeting to consider the future of a global open data for agriculture and nutrition initiative. This would provide open access to data sets that are produced uh, by that public investment in agricultural science and would provide access for scientists anywhere in the world to those data sets. Uh, we're also very uh, supportive of the UN-led global strategy to improve agricultural and rural statistics, very active participants in the expert groups that have been convened uh, by FAO in support of that initiative. And again, if we don't have good data on our agricultural production, we're not going to be able to assess how well we're doing in meeting the global challenges. We're also advocates for open access to germplasm that can be used to improve crops or, or, and, and animal uh, agriculture around the world. And also very uh, keenly aware of the importance of improving technology transfer, moving those developments from the lab into the marketplace as soon as we possibly can, and looking to uh, work with other countries in the G8 and the G20 to come up with new ways that we can be supportive of increasing that lab to market transfer. So this is how we're proposing and are working on uh, making the research investment domestically uh, even more supportive of the Feed the Future objectives. So we look forward to the continued partnership uh, and also, I uh, want to uh, commend all of you for the work that you've been doing uh, to feed the future. Thank you.